Hello, my name is Francis Pinder, and you are watching or listening, perhaps, to the Salesforce Posse podcast, where I speak with Salesforce industry influencers so we can gain a better understanding of how to excel in a career path from a Salesforce admin or developer to an architect. But before we start, I'm on a little bit of a mission to prove that there's an inner Salesforce architect in all of us. Because for me, a Salesforce architect is all about design, but not all design is architecture. So I think of an, an architectural decision as something that's going to be hard or expensive to change in the future. So if you create an object in Salesforce, put flows, put uh, reports on it, do integrations, link it to other objects, this is going to be hard to change in the future. But I'm also trying to debunk the myth that Salesforce or uh, uh, an art that Salesforce architect is all about understanding the technical aspects of Salesforce, which is really not the complete case. So if you head to salesforceposse.com slash scorecard, you can score yourself against a free scorecard that measures yourself against the key skills that a Salesforce architect needs to be successful and also gives you personalized feedback at the end. And you may be a little bit surprised by the results. <laughs> but back to the show. And in this conversation, I'm going to be talking to Kirsten Jorgensen, who is a solution architect and now team lead at WAG, an IBM company and he is a fountain of knowledge around making Salesforce projects successful. So I wanted to pick his brains around the things that you should be focusing on to really delight your users and customers that interact with Salesforce. He's also written a fantastic book, the Salesforce End-to-End -end Implementation Handbook, which really is that end-to-end -end picture of how to deliver superior business outcomes using the Salesforce platform. So if you're interested in understanding how to link the visions and goals of an organization to a Salesforce implementation, or want to dem just want to really show the and demonstrate the value of Salesforce or struggle to do that, or how, how to manage everyone wanting a bit more of Salesforce and really not knowing where to start or even just understanding the common traps that people fall into running Salesforce projects or agile programs, then I think you're gonna get a lot of value out of this conversation with Christian. So without further ado, let's go. Hi Christian, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, great to be here. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to kind of get you on the show because um, you were kind of all things, you know, project management, project creation and, and getting the best practice out of Salesforce implementations uh, and making sure it's done the right way. But before we kind of get all into that, what was your history? How did you get into Salesforce originally? Yeah, uh, great question. So I think it was uh, about 10 years ago, I was uh, working with a company that was uh, going to replace both the billing platform and the CRM uh, mm. in one go, uh, going from on-prem to the cloud, Salesforce. Right. And that's where I first heard of it. Uh, I was in a, uh, in a channel management function supporting sales directors and contact center managers uh, in how to keep track of their business and, and control it. So I was mm. a, an SME in the Salesforce project from the customer side. Okay. Um, and then some... Some years later, I, I moved over to the, to the consultant side, uh, actually right. with the same company that was, uh, that was helping out. Okay, cool. So how long have you been kind of in IT, I suppose, for? Uh, could you repeat? How, how, so how long have you been in kind of the IT industry before kind of moving into Salesforce? Yeah, absolutely. So it would be around five years now. Okay. Um, first four years at uh, Capgemini, and mm -hmm. then now about a year at Wake, which is a, a specialized uh, Salesforce boutique company within mm -hmm. IBM. Okay, cool. So, um, how, like, I think the, so 
the way Salesforce is implemented, I think it's kind of started to change, hasn't it? Kind of, we've kind of, we're seeing this shift um, in projects. Can, um, do you have kind of any, any insight in that and, and how, what you're seeing yeah. currently in the industry? Yeah, sure. And maybe it's helpful just to go a bit down memory lane, uh, even to before I was part of uh, the ecosystem, right? Because Salesforce started out as this, uh, with only sales cloud, right? That, that's mm, what it yeah. was, uh, helping out sales organizations, you know, better than me from back <laughs> in the day. Uh, and it's then evolved, right? With the, both uh, organic expansion, product development, yeah. uh, service cloud, and then now spans marketing, uh, commerce, uh, field service, you know, integrations, mm -hmm. analytics, uh, so many things, uh, and companies also uh, leveraging and taking use of all those uh, great innovations uh, in the mm -hmm. portfolio, right? And and that's, I think, is what you're asking. Implementations, have they also, yes, they have also seen a massive increase in complexity, yeah. technically, business, uh, you're talking to so many different parts of the organization now. Um, that you weren't uh, back then in the early days, right? Hmm. I think also people. I think it's it almost like it's like people are more aware of Salesforce. I think now, and it's almost like you know you're in when you're well, even within your company. You know, people go, "Oh, we've got Salesforce now." I, you know, can we do this, this, and this? And suddenly, you're kind of the the, the scope of work kind of increases, yeah. I suppose, across across the project. So, how you know when you're first implementing a project. It's kind of like it's always greed feel very easy, right? So as you and the honey, you know, this honeymoon period, as I know you talk about, is is kind of like the easy bit at the start, and then you start maturing and things get more complex. How do you see, yeah. you know, putting kind of governance and controls and things in a project? Yeah. Or what are the kind of key things you find people mistakes that people make going along that road? Sure. So I think um, if we just go back to that. Uh that greenfield uh, yeah. implementation right just just a little bit because that that's really interesting because it's not all all honeymoon uh as such oh, right yeah. they're, they're the the people you're interacting with uh on the customer side may have uh, heard of salesforce or other crm uh but they there's so many things you need to introduce uh terms uh best practices, uh, mm. what comes out of the box, what's not, what does it mean configuration versus not, uh, all these different things, uh, is what you, you need to slowly use change management for to, to get, uh, in inside. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but then yes, uh, if we talk about the, the rollout, uh, and the continuous improvement there, you will likely have digressed or transgressed from being in this project mode to more continuous improvement of mm. the domains you already have there. And how do you decide where to go? What, what user stories or features or business problems should you attack uh, next, right? Um, how mm. should you do it? Um, who reviews and qualifies? Do you have a design authority? Uh, if you're working with partners, how, how do you structure that? um is it still statements of work yeah oh, sorry go on yeah yeah so do you, you like even like you said like design authority it's like do you need when do you know when you need a design authority or when do you it's it's there's it's a lot of complexity in that right as well uh you might be in yeah. an established organization that has a design authority but doesn't know salesforce um yeah so yeah how do you even how do you make those decisions right yeah Sure. That's so I think, important. yeah, for sure. I think if, uh, you know, in the traditional waterfall, mm. you would have these gates uh, along the way, uh, other business requirements understood mm. and detailed uh, check. Okay, then go into design phase. Uh, yeah. Is the design, does that live up to and, and so on. So there you had it built in sort of, sort of, where if you're going anything that looks like agile or hybrid agile, where you don't do all of that architecture upfront to the detail, then you need to have regular uh, points uh, throughout uh, with a regular cadence where someone with experience uh, assesses proposed solution designs. And that may be at a mid, mid level, or it may be at the, at the user story level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going back to the Greenfield site, if I've kind of like done an initial 
implementation, relatively small, but it was really successful. Um, and yeah. now it's kind of been socialized within the organization of people are kind of getting to see what Salesforce can do. And everybody's wanting a part of it, right? And want to bring their, yeah. their changes in. Um, you know, adoption's high and it's, things are going well. But how do you manage that? Uh, and how do you yeah. kind of make sure you're doing the right thing uh, and you're not kind of death by backlog almost? Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I think there the whole concept of the product owner uh, re really plays a, a big, big role. Uh, some greenfield implementations are sort of hybrid agile or more agile, meaning they definitely need to have a product owner part of the development team. Uh, and ideally, that person with all that knowledge that uh, they have built up should continue being part of the Salesforce team. Uh, mm. and, and would also know how to qualify, uh, any requests that come in, right. But you need to have a forum where you review these types of things. What, what should be uh, assessed against are the product goals, which should mm. be aligned to the overall vision and strategy of the company. Um, but there, sh there of course needs to be the synthesis of what's expected and desired by the organization and users of the solution versus what's the overall business strategy. So that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. where the, the rubber meets the road, uh, for whether this whole setup is, is really working, right? Cause it's yeah, uh, yeah. sometimes two different, uh, things, sometimes it's aligned and that's great. Um, but you need to have, uh, some, some guidance there. Okay. And how does that work with, so. So you've got the product owner who is kind of the responsible party, making sure that what is getting built is relevant for the values and the goals of the organization. Um, but how do you kind of balance that with like the architectural and technical goals? Like maybe the project's been around for a lot longer and there's a lot, a lot of tech debt in there. And actually yeah. it's always constantly just swept under the carpet because you're focusing on the backlog and the yeah. business change, right? So how do you manage, yeah. manage that? Yeah. So I, ideally the product owner is uh, experienced because it is a senior role. You are making mm. big, uh, big decisions within your organization. Uh, so the person should be experienced knowing there is something called enablers or technical enablers uh, that need to be in place for the fun functional, uh, uh, features to, to be able to be developed uh, for the benefit of users. Um, mm -hmm. It needs to be a close cooperation between the architect, the platform architect, or the team of architects and the product mm -hmm. owner or product owners. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a marriage, uh, you could say, uh, because fulfilling a long-term roadmap takes, uh, takes both, uh, views. So how, how do we get, so it's really just making sure everybody's included and that those technical elements are thought of as we're kind of rolling through through the change I yeah guess yeah yeah exactly and and if you were asking so how do you do that uh, specifically concretely practically mm. um i i think there are different models right uh maybe the more devopsy is to say we do it continuously in every sprint uh, mm. we will also have uh, some time allocated for uh, technical debt or refactoring, continuous refactoring. Mm -hmm. um, for some organization that works. For others, it's to say every four or eight sprints, we will have a dedicated sprint just for refactoring. Um, yeah. I, I think there are pros and cons to, to each way of, of doing that. Uh, the latter may seem less DevOpsy or less agile. Uh, but if you have that concretely on your on your plan, you know, okay, every two months we have a sprint dedicated to that, then it actually gets done. So yeah, better to have something that actually gets done than something that is, uh, we'll do it within the sprint. <laughs> I, but I'd at the end I, of the day. Yeah, I tend to prefer <laughs> that as well, because also you can kind of like get the stats out of what are the slowest running processes? What are the things that actually you want to focus on during that sprint? Um, and yeah. so you're ready and prepared for it rather than the, oh, we've got 10 story points we need to use on technical debt this month. Uh, I'll just tidy this up. Oh, you know, whatever it may yeah, be. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
Exactly. So if you're if you're not doing anything uh, to to alleviate technical debt or re continuous refactoring, maybe start with that latter approach where you say dedicate a sprint or some time um, at at certain increments, but then have the ambition to go to the more correct or devops -y way of doing it continually, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, I think and also it kind of comes down to like the level of technical debt you're at as well, I think. Uh, and is yeah. it a, a real problem for you for delivering change uh, based on, you know, which approach you take, which I think is fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so also there's a thing called the center of excellence, right? Uh, and you've actually just written a book um, uh, the Salesforce end-to-end -end, uh, implementation handbook, which is fab. Yeah. Uh, and in there, you kind of talk about um, the center of excellence and the importance of a center of excellence. Can you kind of yeah. describe basically what it is, um, but also why is it important? When At what point should this start to become kind of yeah. brought into an organization? Thing. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um so I think uh, may maybe we can say well, what it's not, right? So it's not a management or uh, that type of uh, body. It's a governance uh, forum, a structure uh, to guide um, uh, a team or teams of people working uh, on the Salesforce uh, platform, right? Um, and, and when should it be there? Um, so... If you consider before you even buy Salesforce licenses, right, you will likely have a team of people in your organization who are assessing what should we do. We want a CRM or a new CRM. Okay, let's go with Salesforce. And then they're looking into what capability should be supported, uh, the business case, all, all of this. Uh, those people are likely some of the, the good people that are going to be part of the implementation as well and on an ongoing basis. And likely it, it, it needs to require both business and technical and project or PMO delivery uh, people, because uh, it's really those three uh, uh, aspects that you want to put some governance uh, in place around. So both business, technical governance and delivery governance. Um, why? Because it lowers risk if you have uh, if you have guidelines and structures uh, and guardrails in place, then it just lowers risk uh, risk that you build the wrong thing that you don't uh, deliver according to your your plans uh, and and so on. Hmm. And you're continuously maturing rather than doing the same old same old, I suppose as well. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, so when you're kind of working in Salesforce change projects, what are the kind of common mistakes you see happening when they're trying to manage a project? Yeah, I think um, let, let's just uh, highlight uh, two or three uh, of them, right? So I think it's uh, typically that end users or the target users of your solution uh, have not been involved or not enough or not early enough um, and that's really a big risk, right? If you you can sit and you can have workshops uh, with yourself or some other parts of the business and say, hey, we really need this. Uh, but it's not really until you go to market that you see if uh, what you're thinking of uh, actually meets, uh, meets the goals, right? The other uh, is that it's a, a siloed organization and what you're doing in the corner, let's say it's an IT-led project, um, it should ideally be both IT and, and business all together in some symbiosis. But if it is just isolated and you don't have anyone from the business or from senior management sponsoring and being part of the conversation, you risk that you're building something that isn't really in line with the overall business and business strategy, right? Um, so that's, that's probably the second one, lack of uh, executive uh, sponsor involvement. Because if you don't have that continuously throughout, uh, that that that's a big risk. So, so what would happen if you if you didn't, for some examples? Sure. So, if you don't have, uh, let's say, the alignment to the overall business strategy, and you have a uh, little engagement with executive uh, mm. sponsor, uh, sometimes people leave the company, 
So let's say you, you someone else joins to take the role of executive sponsor, mm. look at the project and see, oh, but what you're doing here is not aligned to the business strategy. Let's discontinue it or let's go yeah. another direction. Um, so it's really this lack of continuity if you don't have all those things in, in place. Yeah, and I think I've, I've uh, yeah, and also I've, I've kind of been on the projects where it's a kind of a lift and shift technical thick side where it's kind of like we're replacing this with Salesforce because Salesforce is so much better, but they're just yeah. lifting and shifting all that bad practices and everything into the new system you're not yes. getting the value and it's not linked to yeah. any strategy or goals or anything approach that they're trying to go to yeah and you just lose so all the value Con conway's law right where <laughs> if, if you're designing it within the context of your own organization and you don't have external input or inspiration mm. right yeah yeah and i think this is where yeah you and it's, it's that kind of the it's that p p tug i suppose between getting external people in to implement Salesforce versus the implementation yourself or trying to do it in a hybrid way um, yeah. and what level of engagement that has as well. Uh, I think because even when I, yeah, working at a consultancy, I think I've been in projects where it was almost like they let the consultancies just do everything, right? And they had, they really kind of was a hands-off approach and you're kind of, the consultancy are trying to, you know, deliver a result. <laughs> Um, but they, they've got nothing to go on. <laughs> and they're, they're not linking yeah. to any goals or anything or a strategic yeah. vision. And yeah, again, it's like, it doesn't get good positive outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. You so, need to have a... Yeah, yeah sorry, say again. No, go on. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree, right? You you need to have someone to, to interact with, uh, to mm. understand the context and the, the users and the business. Absolutely. It's key. Mm. Yeah, and communication as well, that it's happening, that, you know, that people are aware of it, that people engage with it to kind of get the buy-in, get the adoption, get the kind of the quick wins and what's in it for me, you know, yeah, out. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, Salesforce is all about, like, the customer 360, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think we've all been there where it's like, yes, we want a 360-degree view of the customer, but... What are the kind of realities when, you know, if you've got a project that is, yeah, we want a customer, a 360 degree view of the customer, go. <laughs> and the realities yeah. around that. Yeah. No, I've, I've, I've heard and seen many different uh, impressions of what that actually means, right? Mm -hmm. From account page layouts with everything on it uh, and endless scrolls. So, yes, there you have it, all the information you wanted about your customer. But is that in a meaningful way, right? Mm. Um, and then also just to the to the completeness of it, I think, yes, it should be perhaps the ambition, right? Um, but also important to think of in the context of the specific user. So for mm. a salesperson, uh, the 360 means one thing, right? Uh, it's certain yeah. things that are key and important to, to know. Same for a customer service, same for a field service uh, person, um, many different types of roles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think, secondly, the it should be the ambition to get there, um, but it's okay to start with a 180 or a 290 uh, <laughs> yeah. customer view uh, as, as long as that's uh, the, the ambition, right? Because uh, you do yeah. want to have that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of had the right data at the right time for the right role. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is yeah. always, yeah, tricky. And it's, some organizations, I, was, I remember I was working for a insurance company and actually they were like, hey, let's guess because insurance is very siloed, yeah, where you've got, you know, the, the organization sells many different types of insurance, but it's all very separate. Yeah, life insurance is one department, you know, mm. home insurance is another, but they don't really talk to each other. And they were like, let's bring everything together. But then they started kind of coming across it, challenges with that. Um, mm. So uh, and I remember there was an incident where they were, you know, rocking up to their customers' houses and saying, hey, look, yeah, we want to talk about your, you know, your life insurance and stuff like that. And they've combined life insurance policies and home insurance together. And, mm. uh, and they'd have challenges where, you know, the people in the house 
didn't want the other people to know what insurance policies they'd had on them, right? Because they don't want to get bumped off by their wife or their husband or whatever. Uh, and actually bringing all these policies together as a family unit actually started. Mm. Oh, and so there's such challenges even just bringing data together, isn't there? Um, yeah. and, and wanting that 360 degree view when actually you still got to have these kind of firewalls and visibility rules and stuff in place uh, so that yeah. not every, you know, Yes, it's tied together, but in some cases, not everybody can see everything. Uh, yeah, uh, for the and they're seeing it for the right reasons. Yeah, that sounds a bit more like uh, also organizational business change uh, <laughs> challenge, right? Uh, for for the insurer, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Going absolutely. to market with different uh, divisions uh, at the same time for the same. Uh, customer so, segments and so on. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And they, they know that they've got to connect together, but then, yeah, it, it's finding that that approach that allows them to market right, but not, yeah. God, yeah, yeah. It's, it's this challenging space. But um, So if, uh, how would you go about if you were, look, I know there's value in using Salesforce, yeah? And I mm. know the organization can really value on doing some processes or doing something in Salesforce. Um, but I know, mm. obviously, I've got to get a budget for it. I've got to prove that it's worth doing. Yeah. How do I get a case together to actually pitch it to say, hey, look, I think this is going to be a good piece of work to do? Yeah. So let's say you, uh, for example, that you are a, a business uh, person within the company right let's say you are working in sales as a sales manager or sales director you will likely have seen that it works salesforce works for you or it has worked for you in uh, in another company uh, previously so you want to interact with the executive sponsor you want to get someone uh, in senior management who can be part of that journey to convince uh, the organization uh, to go for this right um, you need someone from IT, like an enterprise architect or some, someone who can, uh, who can talk about, okay, the system landscape, uh, how's it looking, uh, what capabilities are supported by what, what's the roadmap, um, where would Salesforce fit into that? Because um, you also need the buy-in uh, from the IT organization typically, right? Um, and then you need this, uh, this driver. It can either be yourself or you can have someone from like a PMO organization if you have that. Um, and, and then you need to go, th you need to do the work, right? You need to interact and understand those capabilities. Let's say it's sales, it's account management, lead management, opportunity, quote management. Uh, all of that you need to understand, not in the detail, but you at least need to understand what what are the processes? What are the pain points? Because if there aren't pain points, what are you really trying to do, right? Uh, um, so, so that that work you need to do, and then look at the KPIs. Look, look at where you're, where are you tracking now? If it's a, let's say, sales domain uh, project, you need to see. Okay, is it our order value that's lacking? Is it our hit rate? Is it the uh, how long it takes for us to close our opportunities. So you need to look at what, what, what factors within revenue is it that you can change and want to change with your, with your project. Uh, and then you can build a business case around that uh, together with someone from finance um, and then present that business case and, and get, get funding. So it sounds really linear and simple, but oftentimes you have to go <laughs> several loops uh, and, and that's all right. Um, yeah, yeah. I think also it's kind of it's getting that credibility right. So once you've proven that, hey, look, there's a long lead time, or there's a manual process that's happening here, and getting X amount of yeah. mistakes, which is costing this amount of money, it's yeah. then proving it at the end of the day. Once you've done it, hey, I've reduced it by this, and yes. I've done this, and then it's almost like, ah, yeah. The business case, does it come from Francis? Oh, it'll be fine then, because he knows he's, he's done his, <laughs> yeah. he always does a, you know, his due diligence on this, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I think I it kind of comes into that other part of that kind of managed project or Salesforce implementation projects, that kind of trust and that kind of moving yeah. from that functional way of thinking of implementing Salesforce and job done, kind of moving into that kind of trusted advisor onto becoming vital. Uh, for the organization yeah. so you kind of start 
always find it's kind of like if you're new, you don't actually know truly maybe what the actual goals and the vision of the organization are. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of building up that trust such that you are actually then start getting privy to the well actually we're selling five different products and there's five different teams all selling it and actually we just want to you know it's stupid they can all sell the same set of products and it means we have a cost saving by reducing the team for example Uh, and obviously you're not privy to that (laughs) initially but once you start building up the trust and they know you're not going to go blabbing to that those teams but then that can really help you in in the way you kind of design and architect your solutions as well absolutely yeah cool so um if i was like going uh, so say i'm on a project and it's not going so well maybe it wasn't, you know, it was a more of a big bang project. You know, you're halfway through and you realize that's probably, you know, okay, we've got, it was a mistake. You know, we've now got a lot of stuff that we need to deliver. But there's lots of issues. Um, mm-hmm. And you've got problems happening. How do you kind of dig yourself out of that kind of type scenario where, or maybe you've kind of been brought into a project where it is a, a little bit chaotic and yep. you how, what are the kind of first key steps or key things you think about or do to kind of try yep. and get the project back on track? Sure. So you're saying it's a it's a project that was meant to be released in a big bang after yep. a bunch of different capabilities should have been built or are being built, but have not yet been released. Something yep. like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I, I think I would... Uh, follow the the steps uh right so what is it really that we're trying to achieve what Mm. what's really key um so going through all the things that should uh be done uh, earlier in the in the pre-development phase uh as i as i call it right uh go back to the to the business case uh go back to see what were the the key pain points for the capabilities that are part Mm. of the scope um and then try to work with the with the with the project team to see is it possible to chop something up uh in releases could we yeah. perhaps go live with the uh, uh let's say the sales domain or the service domain and then add on marketing and mm-hmm. commerce later um is, is that an option sometimes it is sometimes you need uh interim mm-hmm. integrations otherwise people will need to work in two systems uh, so so there are of course uh, trade-offs that's uh, what being an architect is about is uh, is sharing the options but highlighting the trade-offs with uh, with either one right yeah um so i i think be clear on what what the goal is see if you can chop it up so it doesn't become so much as a big bang mm-hmm. uh and maybe go with more of a pilot approach and then roll out in waves um that that set of functionality uh, and then you can always add add more mm-hmm. later. And even start, yeah, start small and experiment. It doesn't have to roll out to everybody, maybe. I think the smallest I ever did was literally account and contacts, and that was it. It was literally a company Rolodex, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, and that was it. It was just to prove that the integration, you know, the data migration worked, to prove yeah. that, you know, they could see all the data. And then really, it was all read-only, because obviously we didn't know if the data was right. Um, so you couldn't create any new records. It was literally a company Rolodex, but they could yeah. do loads of reporting. They could do loads of stuff they could never do previously, which they found really invaluable. Yeah. Uh, and then we just slowly iterated from there. But could could they log calls and activities against those? Exactly. Yeah. Even, could, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Even just that, and you know, it's just kind of a revelation for some companies, isn't it? <laughs> Oh my word! We can see who's actually contacting our customers. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think as as I think also, you kind of get a bit bogged. I, I know I I do. You kind of get a bit bogged down in the Salesforce is so vast and can do so much. You think yeah. that you need to deliver a lot to get value, mm. but actually, if you really look at it and really kind of talk to people and users and re- and, and yeah. the, the, the vision of the, kind of the the strategic goals of where they want to get to some of it is very simple almost yeah. just to 
get loads of value out of Salesforce by just using even just a company Rolodex and bringing that data together, right? Yeah. Um, and so really kind of understanding that is like absolutely key uh, yeah. and, and kind of measuring it as well. So you can see actually, yeah, well, I did make a benefit, you know, I did benefit the users uh, and they yeah. are, you know, finding it useful. And now the organization as a whole can have mm -hmm. a better picture of what's going on. Uh, so you've so your book coming back to your book you why did you create the salesforce end-to-end <laughs> -end implementation guide because yeah there's a lot of project management books out there <laughs> there's a lot of salesforce yeah. books out there so why did you feel sure. that you, you you wanted to create a book on salesforce implementation yes yeah. good good question well i um through the years in in consulting i i often wondered hmm there should be a structured way to do this mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly, just like we have um, best practices and we have architecture patterns, uh, we, we development guidelines and testing guidelines. You, th there's so many things. Uh, and sure, there is also uh, for project management and there is for agile uh, different things. But how, how do you mix and merge it all together in a, in a Salesforce context? Mm -hmm. So I thought that's missing uh and then i frankly just became confident enough and was uh pushed a little bit by by someone i had worked with previously tamim bari who i'm who i'm grateful for uh giving me the encouragement to to pursue it right um so it's this uh this mix of thinking i would really have liked to have had this uh book when i started out mm. in salesforce yeah uh, maybe I don't get to work on all the different corners in the book because it does span the entire implementation uh, life cycle, right? Uh, sometimes you're only part of uh, the development. Sometimes you're not part of rollout, but mm. it's still seeing what are the different bits and pieces involved and considerations and change management and communication and local deployments. Um, I, I just think it's a, it's something that I would have loved to have had when I when I was starting mm. out. Um, and I also like to uh, think that it's, it, uh, it can increase empathy. So because there are so many different people involved, it's not just end users and developers, it's mm. many different parts of the organization. So if you read it and you get to see what changes for many different parts, it'll increase your empathy when you get to be part of projects and start to engage. Mm. Um, that was my my hope at least yeah yeah and the challenges that other people have in the organization have that you can yeah definitely and also i kind of find that i don't know i feel that like salesforce is a lot more business led than it led so it it, it does have a kind of a different um, implementation approach i suppose than a traditional it project where mm. i don't know you're maybe thinking a lot more about the non-functional requirements so a lot more about you know the security implications where mm. a lot of that is kind of taken off your hands by salesforce uh, and not as the case may be so making sure yeah. you get that balance um but yeah it's yeah it's a really fascinating book uh, and it's definitely definitely worth a read um what do you think are like who is the who is the book so you said it's kind of like it's aimed at like the people that if you, you'd wish you'd had when you started your yeah. your salesforce journey but also yeah. there's loads of other stuff in there like you know creating a coe creating so it's not just you know that kind of beginning journey i i, I feel anyway when i'm looking at it yeah yeah for sure so i i'd say it's a <clears throat> it's targeted at uh at mainly end customers who are actually having and using Salesforce mm -hmm. or considering implementing Salesforce in their organization. And that could be a product owner. It could be a PMO lead, uh, could be a scrum master. Um, it could be an architect. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's really for, for everyone. Um, and then I think it's for also consultants, uh, who are working with uh, customers because this really shows the considerations that, companies are having to mm. go through uh, throughout the implementation life cycle right yeah 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 cool okay um have you got any other questions that you want to raise mm. 
Uh, not that I really, really can think of um, right now. I mean, I do know you have your last question, right? And <laughs> yeah. I have a that classic have last a... question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah. I ask everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. you, so you ready for the last question? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So uh, yeah, so I yeah, ask it to pretty much everybody. Um, if you could wind back that clock to a point in time in your past and mm. you could give yourself some advice, what point in time would it be and what advice would you give yourself? It's a great question. Let me think. Uh, so I, I think I would probably go back to when I was, uh, when I started uh, on the consulting side, mm. uh, like five, five years ago. And uh, I I'd been doing a bunch of stuff uh, before joining, let's say, the the IT side. Uh, I'd been in sales. Uh, I have a degree in marketing. I've been in channel management and BI and finance. So a lot of different things. And I think it's the same story for many different people in the Salesforce ecosystem. Not everyone studies computer science yeah. and then goes into development or architecture, right? Um, so my advice would be have more confidence to bring your knowledge and your context and industry knowledge yeah. to to work um and then also as as soon as I, uh, I i i got the appetite to do more than let's say user story uh development and and so on just uh speak up and say i have appetite for more uh please can i be part of a let's say an epic or a feature level uh design and and so on so speak up and reach for the for the opportunities yeah absolutely they, they're not always just given to you yeah no, completely and even like yeah. yeah that advice on on all your previous experience you can bring on board i think a lot of people like a lot of my students are kind of like i've come from this industry or that industry and, and i think everybody it's thinks amazing it's, it's, yeah everybody thinks yeah. it's like a i stop and salesforce mm -hmm. is a completely new thing right but it's not. It's like it's so linked to specific industries and industry knowledge and, yeah. and and things like that. And actually just, you know, you can, you know, if you come from a retail background or a finance mm -hmm. background or whatever it may be, all these organizations in those industries use Salesforce, yeah. you know. So and that is and, and the Salesforce is so close to the business. That knowledge is so important uh, and so useful in, in your career. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. And also, yeah, the opportunity, ask for those opportunities and find out, but like Trailhead, you know, find out or oh, more about it. So you can kind of give that advice and kind of go, oh, have we thought of this? This could be yeah. an interesting way. <clears throat> yeah, and, and asking that because <clears throat> I think um, <clears throat> organizations aren't really, you know, well, back in my dad's father's day, you know, they'd be getting training. It was a life career and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Whereas now it's, you it definitely, you know, if you want to progress your career, you got to think about yourself <laughs> and, and and learn, for, you know, yourself and, and reach for those opportunities because they're not yeah. going to just come, you know. Oh, and one thing, yep. get a mentor, uh, yeah. either internally where you're at or externally. Or perhaps I've heard of this guy who who helps admins become architects. Uh, so th there are yeah. plenty of resources out there. Uh, so use them absolutely, right absolutely yeah and even like even if it's not a mentor or a sponsor mm. um somebody who can actually put your name forward or really kind of go yeah. actually uh, you know i can put you in contact with people that can help yep. your career so it's not even you know it's not kind of a mentor or, or, as such you know it always kind of helps yeah. as well yeah brilliant so you've also, you've actually created a website called the Salesforce Implementation Help Center, which is quite cool. Can you tell a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it, it's based off the book where I describe four phases of a Salesforce implementation. There is pre-development before you even buy licenses and provision an org or get new licenses for a new project. Then there's development, there's rollout, where you want to ensure adoption and support it. And then there's continuous improvement, which is everything after. Uh, and for each of those phases, you typically face uh, some challenges, some common issues. Uh, and it's around those that I thought, hey, maybe it would be useful for people to be able to access uh, these different issues and the underlying 
root causes uh, in a sort of knowledge article. Um, so I went ahead and together with one of the technical reviewers, uh, Tony Com, uh, we built this uh, community site or experience cloud site where you can where you can go into sf-e2e.com. Uh, you can find out, okay, what uh, phase am I in? What overall common issue am I facing? And then you'll be presented with the potential root causes, and then you can see the resolution or strategy for mitigation. Um, so sort of like the help center where Salesforce has a technical, how to implement uh, sales cloud or digital engagement or whatever it may be, then this is more for the implementation help center. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for the being on the podcast. It's been oh, fab. Thanks for having me. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Thanks for watching or listening to the Salesforce Posse podcast. Now, please, 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 if you like or what you see or hear, then please rate this podcast in your podcast player as it tells me that there are people out there that actually are listening to this and that it's useful to them. Also, it helps the podcast algorithms to kind of elevate the podcast in the different podcast directories, which will be really helpful for me as well. And Finally, if you do have a question that you want to ask on the podcast, then head to salesforceposse.com slash message and maybe you'll appear in the next podcast. But apart from that, thanks for listening and until next time, ta-ta!